it will be a fulfilling one. First, let me start by apologizing for not starting at the right time. We're supposed to have started at 8.30. I was talking traffic. I had to run 4.40. Mainly, I was able to avoid the decongestion. I'm grateful to God that I'm here. I'm here live and direct. Okay, so please, uh, let's just give uh, dedicate to the next few minutes. Just uh, bow your heads to pray because what we're about to discuss is a very, very crucial matter. Very, very crucial matter. So I don't like us to just dive into it with our sensual knowledge or with uh, experiential knowledge, but I want us to just dive into it with God unveiling himself to us. And we just begin to pray. Just, if you don't know what to say, just say, Father, unveil yourself to me. Unveil yourself to me. Just show me. Show me. Show me yourself. Just, just open up to me. Open up to me tonight, Lee. And if you can pray in the spirit, just pray in the spirit in the next two, three minutes. El garido bralagato son de que estará gorra malagato zipla de garada balagato que estará do zupre le bichum brala besete le gadebre le radu brala buba para hakali roto sopra la besta le gare. Can you just point your hands and just pray your heart out? The Lord, you will speak to my spirit. You will speak to my soul. You will speak to my body. You will speak to my very being. You will speak to my very being. Lika raha kalaha do brala bo shore de gebala. Eli gere de balego raha le koro brala be moronda kubali karanda kele gede brala bo kusore de bele gede. Brala to zande ya ramro lo monsh ton de gede brala mbrondo bali irada kopari kapasa tara brala kapapa parando bala. Ele gede brala be shore gede blapa brala monda parlong maraha kalabi karato sa brala be le gede. Ebla leo brala ba ondo brala kanale karaha tabara no kusore le be shore gede brala basa. I connect every one and listen to my voice to the frequency of the Holy Ghost. 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 I come. I connect everyone under the sound of my voice tonight. To the frequency of the Holy Ghost. We will not hear the voice of man, but we hear the voice of God. Even as God, we use man. We use man to speak to us tonight. In the name of Jesus, I receive power. I am empowered to speak as an oracle of God tonight. I receive power to hear God's voice clearly for his people. I receive power to solve the problems, the deep secret of the heart, to answer those deep questions tonight. Thank you, Heavenly Father. We give you all the praise. In Jesus' precious name, we we'll pray. Amen. One more time, I want to say a very big thank you for everyone to be here. This is the, I trust us, God, that this will be the last class for tonight. And um, I'm looking forward to, once again, I want to apologize for not starting at the right time. So I want to, it was beyond my control, but I thank God for taking all the glory. Okay, so. Conflicts and communication management. Hmm. I tell you the truth. This is a very cogent topic. And you know, many of the topics that we, many of the courses we have discussed all through in these classes, we have discussed topics that don't just apply to church services but even to your workplace, even to your personal work with God, even in your married relationship, even in your day-to-day -day workings. So we continue tonight as we discuss on the topic conflicts and communication management. I'm going to be saying some few things. 
You may not agree with it. I must tell you the truth. But I'd like you to write them down. Write them down. Reflect on them. Then ask questions. So that I can expand shit if needed. Can I expand shit if needed? All right. Number one hard facts. Number one hard facts. Conflict. Crisis. In the church, in the mosque, in the society, in the family, in the workplace, it is inevitable. What does it mean? It means there are no perfect person on this earth. No matter how hard we try, you cannot avoid conflict and crisis. So, I will just beg you, stop avoiding conflict. <laughs> That's another fact I'm telling you already. Stop avoiding conflict. Uh, come on, ah, sorry, I'm speaking Yoruba. I said I won't speak Yoruba. Sorry, sorry. If you don't understand Yoruba, uh, we use that common balance, that word commonly in um, among us. I don't want to be, I don't want them to offend me. So, they want to avoid conflicts. They want to avoid crisis. They want to avoid having a face-off with a person. No, don't worry. Just stay on your own. Let me stay on my own. No, just leave me. Conflicts, crisis, they are inevitable. There is no fear on earth. Even in your mouth, there is sometimes conflict between your tongue and your teeth. They are in Inevitable. So if we now know that they are inevitable, what should be our response? What should be our part in ensuring that we are able to manage it correctly? Because this is inevitable. It's like you saying, it's inevitable for me to be hungry. It's not possible for you be, to be a human being and not be hungry. So conflict and crisis is like being hungry. You can't avoid hunger. Because there are different seasons of the earth. There are different seasons. There will be time of plenty. There will be time of lack. So conflict is inevitable. I'm emphasizing this first point because... If we get this bedrock of the foundation of this point that conflict is inevitable, many of the hatchets we bring out and the ammunition we bring out, when there is a slight misunderstanding, we will know we will know that it's not necessary. Stop trying to devise um, how do they call it all weapons. Oh, today we are cutting the head off because just of small headache. But it was the same headache. It was the same head that thought of and brought good ideas that solved problems. So now that the head, Hannah has headache, you are saying we should cut off the head. Conflict, crisis in the church is what? Inevitable. If you go through all scriptures, all scriptures, even Genesis, right from Genesis 3, there was a conflict between man and God. And God did not avoid it. <laughs> I heard something tonight that got me thinking. So let me get it. Let me let me say it the way the person said it. He said, Do you agree that God is perfect? I said, Yes, God is perfect. Do you agree that a perfect God created everything and everything, and he said everything was what? Good. I said, Yes, I agree, everything was good. The scripture says it. Everything emphasizes it. The beauty of everything shows that everything he made was what? Good. Okay. Who created the angels? God, of course. Okay, how come God, who created the angels, one third of the angels still had a fallout with God? But you accepted the fact that God was perfect. So do you mean God created imperfect persons? And what God created 
the angels God created angel -o. angels one third of them fell out with God there was a conflict there was a crisis the Bible said there was war in heaven they wanted to unseat God conflict crisis so they are inevitable he said, okay, okay, leave the angels' parts. Okay, maybe they were angels. Maybe the devil entered into them. He said, leave that part. Man, God now created man, man in his own image. So if you read the book of Hebrews, if you go in any conversation with God, that was what Hebrews was saying. Hebrews 1 was saying, Hebrews 1 1. He says, He says, You always you are always mindful of man. So that means every conversation that was going on in heaven, God was always bringing up man. Man, 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 man. Because man was created in the image and the likeness of God. Say, so who, who is man that thou art mindful of him? So that means the mind of God is full of man. God always has a plan for everyone. That's the perfect God. Though. But imagine, the same perfect God from the beginning created the first family. And the same first family were in conflict with God. The very thing God asked them not to do, they did it. And he had to send them away. But what did God do at the end? He had a better plan. He didn't avoid conflicts. He always brought out honey out of the rock. So by my first admonition for everyone under the sound of my voice this morning, this evening is stop avoiding conflicts. Stop avoiding conflicts. They are inevitable. Number two, conflicts arise in every human in relationship from management, friendship, co-worker, marriages, siblings. It is natural to fall into conflict from time to time because we are still in this imperfect world. But interestingly, there are biblical guidelines set up to help us resolve conflict and move forward. Aha. Uh -huh. By beginning to hit the cross of the matter. Now we say conflicts are inevitable. We say they show up in every human relationship. They show up in any ship of any sort. But the question now is, when crises arise, what do we need to do? So that's part of what we are going to be looking at tonight. Because there are biblical injunctions that we were admonished how we should go about it. How we should go about it. Because one of the biggest challenges I've realized, especially when it comes to conflict with conflicts and crises of any sort, the problem is always people get stuck. Even in the scripture, Psalm 23, that we always read, David said, Though I walk through the valley, he is only walking through it. Stop burying yourself in the valley of the shadow of death, in that conflict. Stop burying yourself there. Avoiding it is to bury yourself there. Refusing to resolve the conflict is to bury yourself there. Avoiding to move forward is to bury yourself there. Feeling offended, unforgiven, Unforgiveness is to bury yourself in the valley of the shadows of death. I'll show you tonight. As we go on, you will realize that many times when there is conflict and when there is crisis, it is God that came to visit those people. I can show you from the scripture. It was God that showed up in that situation and it was he all he was just trying to do was to steer up a new move of himself. Maybe some people will, will get comfortable. And God was about to say, no, 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 no. It's time, time you make a move. Don't sit there. Why sit here all while? All long. Move forward. 
to. He steers up a conflict. Maybe he has been saying it, but nobody has been listening. So what does he do? He steers up the environment that there is a form of rejection. He steers up the environment. There is a form of crisis, conflict, altercation. So that man removes his face from human being and puts his trust on him. Total trust. He happened to Apostle Paul. Go ahead and read the scripture very well. If you see, if at a point, he almost wanted to be getting bitter because many people who worked for him, who were pastors under him because he was a bishop of bishops, were leaving him and going away to start up their own. Some of them were even leaving him and started speaking ill about him after. Those are some of the things that led to him writing letters to Timothy, writing letters to some locations that were tri that were Cor the Corinthians, they were that were quarreling. And we say, yeah, some people say, I am for Paul. Some people say, Oh, I'm for Apollos. Some people say, I am for Jesus. <laughs> Those were conflicts. But look at what G uh, Apostle Paul was able to use that. God used him to do. He used him to balance it. That look, everybody has a part in the body. Everybody. Paul has his part. Apollos has his part. Jesus himself has his part. He said, Paul planted Apollo water. God gave the increase. Everybody is a part of the whole. I said to bring that scriptures in as we go on now. Number three, hard facts about conflict and crisis, communication management. Hmm. You may not agree with this one I'm about to say. 99% of all conflicts, 99%, did I even say that? 100% of all conflicts, the problem was communication difficulty. What used to move on to to move on to conflict and crisis, the problem was communication defects. Look at it in the Torah of Babel, Genesis 6. They had planned to build a temple, they built a tower so high into the heavens. So high into the heavens that they could be able to reach God. They had not even started. They only imagined it. And God saw the imagination of their hearts and said, Ah, no man can stop these ones from being, from being able not to achieve what they intend to do. He said, let's stay together. So we're not scattered all about. And what did God do to begin to scatter them? He only changed their communication. He only put a difficulty in their communication. He only gave them different way to listen to things, communicate things. Gave them different language. And the rest is history today. Even the crisis Nigeria, our country, is facing right now is a problem of communication. I'm sorry for bringing up politics here now. But I just want us to get the example. If, for instance, the government of the day speaks eloquently and knows how to persuade his people and is open-hearted in communication, and they're not communicating with bitterness, and they're not communicating with having grudge, or something one thing or the other they are not comfortable with in the back at the back of their hearts. I tell you the truth. Half of our problems will have been solved. The other half will be the people person listening to that communication process, following that dialogue. If he's not listening with prejudice, if he doesn't have a bias already, he has a premonition. You see, all these things are communication difficulties. So most conflicts, the bedrock of it is communication difficulty. For those of us that are married, you will agree with me. The problem is the other person did not understand what you were saying. The other person did not even, do, did not even wait for you to even explain yourself. 
was not even empathic or enough to listen to you. So, how do we solve this problem of communication difficulty? Please, hear me and hear me well. Go and learn and relearn and unlearn how to listen. There's something called active listening. It's a big cause. I tell you the truth. Active listening. You are listening without judging. You are listening with empathy. You are listening with the mind of filling the gap of the same person who was speaking. You are listening to regurgitate without any premonition or without any biases. You are listening with your whole heart. You are listening in love. That's why when I teach love, the L, the acronym for L-O-V-E, L is listening. It's a skill. If you say you want to be in love, you need to learn to listen. Actively listening. Just listen. Stop judging the situation. Just listen. Actively engage your heart your brain, and your hand in the process of communication, you will resolve conflict quickly. Listen. And the O is to be obedient. Is to be obedient. The V is to value each other. Value each other. And the E is to exalt. Exaltation there means you should be able to speak the truth one to another. You should be able to embrace the truth from each other. It's no more love when the other person cannot tell you the truth. But the problem now for conflicts, as I say, as I as we move on, is that conflicts are mostly. Com I have, I keep emphasizing this. The biggest, even in church, even in the church, conflict between pastor and member, conflict between pastor and pastor, conflict between unit leader and members of the units is always communication issue. It's always a matter of communication. And communication is a very big tool because this is where, let me, let me say this at this point to help somebody listening to me tonight. We always communicate from our, um, what do these English people put it? From, there are four dimensions. We have been grouped into four dimensions of personalities. We always communicate from our personality. Uh, if you remember my first lesson, talking about um, personal transformation, I say we are tripartite. You have a spirit, you have a soul, you have a body. It's your soul that can communicate and communicate correctly. That's where you can speak. That's why we are the only animals that can speak and you can relate with what they are speaking. Now, in the place of you speaking, you have that that's which is a soul you have a mind right there under the soul you have a mind right there under the soul you have the intellect right there under the soul you have the will right there under the soul you have the emotion so you see that is where when you communicate one to another the connection so to so connection is activated so you see where conflict comes from God help us. So, like I was saying, we communicate from our personality because our soul is called our... That's the real person. That's what differentiates us from each other. In spirit, we are the same because we got the same spirit from God. In body, which is the flesh, we were from the dust of the earth. So we are the same. The same dust of the earth. You have lungs, I have lungs. 
You have brain, I have brain. The same thing. But what differentiates me from you is in our soul. My emotions, my will, my personality, my desire. It's in the soul. So we always communicate one to another based from those personalities. Um, so researchers have tried to put those personalities into four groups. One, I'm just saying these groups, not in any order, not in any particular. No one is superior. Everyone has his own uniqueness. You can go and study it. Uh, you can lay your hands on uh, the books written by um, Tim Lae. It will help you a lot. Especially the book called The Spirit Controlled Temperament. The Spirit Controlled Temperament. It's a very good book on this subject. Because you, it will help you know who you are. It will help you know the next person. Especially those of us that are married. You help you know them and know their strength. You know their weakness. And you'll be able to know where you need help from the Holy Spirit. No wonder Apostle Paul said, I bring my body under the sub. Because he knew his strength. He knew his weakness. So he decided to say, look, I better hand this over to God. So we always speak from our point of personality, like I was saying. We have the cholerics. Many of those who are cholerics, like my teacher will say, he say, many of us that are choleric are teachers. And we don't take no for an answer. Cholerics. Number two is what we call the sanguines. Those ones are happy talking jolly fellow. Happy talking jolly fellow. They are good in marketing. They can sell anything to you. They can even start up a conversation with a stranger. They are so good. Happy going jolly fellow. That's what I call them. Number three is what we call the melancholy. Mm, those ones, they tend to want to be perfect. Nobody can do anything better than them. You see where crises are beginning. You cannot be impressed. They want everything to be organized. Everywhere must be okay. I know as I'm speaking, you may be seeing yourself. The number four is what we call the phlegmatic. Ah, this group of people are powerful in their thinking, in their brain, when they are alone. But even when they think those ideas, beautiful, laudable ideas, Somebody has to push them because they don't take it. They don't. They don't stand up to move. Somebody will have to push them. The phlegmatic and these things always show up in our communication. So most definitely, if you're listening to the phlegmatic, they always speak as if they are weak, very weak, that they need help. So you uh, quickly people quickly feel empathy for them. And sometimes they can be lazy. It's just their personality. They sound to be lazy in their communication. Unlike the cholerics and the sanguine. Oh my God. The cholerics are exertive in communication. They want it done now. No, no, no. Don't say no. Say yes. They are commanders. You see, that's why when you have bosses like that, you, you now know how to relate with them. Amen and amen. So we need to have a very good understanding of all this. Else, there will be conflicts. The melancholies and the, the melancholics of them when speaking, you have to, be, especially when they are female, because that will also play out, whether you are feminine or uh, masculine. Most of these things I'm explaining, they may not be totally... 100% same, but they are, yeah, but they have some leverage of 90 to 40%. Uniqueness. Just a minute, please. Okay. So, they have some bit of uniqueness in them. And we need to be able to explore this uniqueness to our own profiting, not to conflict, not to crisis. 
So you have to be able to understand these things and be able to know how to resolve conflicts and crises very quickly, very, very quickly. Just like, for instance, imagine if you have two cholerics, two cholerics in, under the same roof. What do you think? There will be too much eruption of fireworks, volcanic eruption. Because everybody is a commander. Nobody is a doer. Nobody does the dirty job. Everybody wants to command. The Lord will help us. Let's move on. Now, let's just look at some types of conflict, now particular for the church, because we are trying to, at this point, we are looking at those who want to join the workforce of the church. Understanding this will help you even when you find yourself in leadership position in the church, in our own local assembly. Dr. Richard is a theologian and has studied the church for, has sent the church severally and um, studied inside and outside and we're trying to, he, he, he concluded on these three things. So there are only three kinds of conflicts. First is the interpersonal conflict, interpersonal. Intra ah, you see the funny thing? You can even be fighting with yourself. <laughs> oh my God. <clears throat> you may be in conflict or in crisis with yourself. When there is substantive conflict. So I will not go into all that as personality, but I'll be staying with the church more often so that we get what God will have us learn tonight. So let's look at um, interpersonal conflict. These are conflicts on personal grounds, such as between members and staff and leaders of the church, between the church members, staff and leaders. Interpersonal conflict is mostly, the 90% of conflict in the church is interpersonal conflict. It's on personal ground. I disagree. I disagree, I don't like this. Even as I'm talking to you right now, you may disagree with what I'm saying. It's a personal, it's on personal ground. It's on personal ground. Who is going to sing in the choir? Who is going to lead the Bible study? No, it should be somebody. It should not be this. It's all interpersonal conflict. And if not well managed, can escalate to negative confrontation. Serious one. It may lead to gossip, slandering, legalism. Where people begin to power control, power play, politics. Let me say it properly. It's not politics. It's not just politics. Anywhere you have human beings, there's politics. But the kind of satanic politics. Let me say it that way. So it sinks. Satanic politics. Where people begin to exalt themselves beyond God. They begin to try and make themselves God to people. Gossip, slander. They cause divisions with the words of their mouths. Just on, it was just a personal thing. Oh, you greeted somebody, he didn't even hear you. But what did you conclude? Uh, don't mind him, that's how he behaves. Anytime I greet him, he doesn't answer me. Um, what does he think he have? It's just on personal grounds. Why does he even give the person benefit of doubt? Maybe he was even going through so many things. Maybe he was thinking of something. Why don't you make an excuse for him or her? I don't make an excuse for them. Like somebody said, and I write down, I say, we, should, we Christians can be like little kids seeking what we can get away. Wait until the parent figure comes back. This is just our human nature. Let's be careful of these things because the devil can, we can use, this can be a point at which the devil can have a foothold in our life. Because it could just be a personal ground. Before you know it, you are nursing unforgiveness. And I tell you the truth. That is why the power of God does not, fi does not find free flow among us in the church these days. If we dig into it and check, many people have unforgiveness against themselves, not to even talk about their spouse. 
or talk about even church, a church member, they have unforgiveness against themselves. Maybe they committed a mistake, they committed a blunder, something happened to them. Circumstances happen one way or the other. They they hang on to it. Maybe I should not have been there. Why did you go there at that point in time? Maybe I, my, 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 and I was thinking about it too, not to go there. They, they still hang on it. And they carry around unforgiven spirits. And you know where where there is where there is no liberty for the spirit of God, he can't flow. He can't even he can't even find himself expression in our midst. If things like that happen, and interestingly, the healing of the man at the pool of Bethsaida, who was at the pool for thirty six years, answers it all. How did Jesus heal that man? The first word Jesus said to him was, "What your sins have been forgiven." I'd like you to go and try and lay your hands on, there's a, there's a harp um, that is teaching the Bible, explaining the Bible in the real, they did their research, going to look for the stories, it's called The, the Chosen. Just look for that harp, it has movies. If you, as, 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 particularly to this story I'm about to share, the John 6 story about the man at the pool of Bethsaida, that man was at that pool for 36 years. You know why? He was angry and offended. He was carrying on forgiveness against his junior brother. In the real story life, his junior brother had left him at the pool and went away and never came back. He never knew what happened to the junior brother. His junior brother was captured by a group of people who were trying to train soldiers. And they, tra they trained soldiers that will rebel against the Romans. His brother was captured. That's the group of people they called the Zealots. That's the background to that story. But he remained in that situation for 36 years. 36 good years. He remained in that place. That's why... You agree with that, the story? When Jesus even came to him to show him help, what was his response? I have no man. And the only man he was looking up to was who? His brother. Was his brother. He didn't even blame his parents. He was blaming the brother. He didn't even blame God. Because he was not born that way. He was not born that way. Something happened to him. I think he fell sick. If I remember that story properly from the video I watched, he fell sick and he ended up losing, being on the um, unable to walk, unable to stand, unable to move. His, I think he, he must have had a disease that has to do with the spinal cord that paralyzed him there. But what paralyzed him more there was unforgiveness. was offense. So I ask the question tonight, what is that one thing that is paralyzing you in that state you find yourself today? He said the snare is broken and you are free like a bird. But stop chaining, don't, Jesus has paid the price. Stop, stop nailing yourself back on the cross. Amen. So please, in the, even in the church, let's deal with conflict correctly. It's not about gossiping about the next person. I'll show you the biblical way we should go about it, but let's go on to intra-personal -conf conflicts. This is conflict with self-desires versus what God desires of us. You see, you're fighting with yourself. I say you're yourself because you can't fight with God. <laughs> no one can fight with God. It's with yourself. You can only fight with yourself. No one can fight with God. But most times when our desires begin to conflict the desire of God for our lives and destiny. When our personalities and desires of an individual are seeking to change and to grow, that is in conflict with the sinful nature 
or other beliefs and ways. The new life in Christ versus the old way of sin. When there's that struggle within you, mind you, that struggle could be there for growth. It's a good one. It's a good struggle. But going through that struggle and building experience to become a matured Christian, I tell you the truth. This is where many adult people who say, I've given uh, uh, all these things you have done, we have done it before. So I, I've been a Christian for the past 30 years. I've been a this for the world. Listen, I always say, this is where the problem is. It's intra is intrapersonal conflict, internal struggle. Maybe the Holy Spirit will expose to you that, look, hey, this, this thing you are doing is a character flaw. Is something that will debar what God is about to do some years later. Change it. You know, what can I? This is me. It's me. Oh. Ah. That's the way people from my village used to be. Oh. Ah. Uh, we are all very, very stubborn. We are all very, very awumba. Yeah. Nobody can cheat us. Hello. Hebrews chapter 1. Let me read something to you. Hebrews chapter 1. Let's read the Bible. I think I've not read the Bible. So I've just. Um, quoted from the Bible without reading in particular. Please, let's read together Hebrews chapter 1. Are you there with me? I read from verse 1 in Jesus' name. It says, God, who at various times and in various ways spoken in time past to the fathers by the prophets, as in these last days spoken to us by his son, whom he has appointed heir of all things, things, through whom also he made the world. Hmm. That means he's emphasizing that Jesus is the word. Who being the brightness of his glory and the express image of his person and upholding all things by the word of his power, when he had by himself purged our sins, sat down at the right hand of the, mind, of the, mind, of the mighty, of the majesty on high having become so much better than the angels as he has by inheritance obtained a more excellent name than they. Are you there? Verse 3 now. No, verse 5, sorry. For to which of the angels did he ever say, you are my son, today have I begotten you. And again, I will be to him a father, and he shall be to me a son. But when he again, again brings the firstborn into the world, he says, let all the angels of God worship him. And of the angels, he says, who makes his angels spirits and his ministers a flame of fire? But to the son, he says, your throne, O God, is forever and ever. Scepter, a scepter of righteousness is the scepter of your kingdom. You have loved righteousness and hated lovelessness. Therefore, God, your God, has anointed you with the oil of gladness more than your companions. And you, Lord, in the beginning laid the foundation of the earth, and the heavens are the works of your hands. They will perish, but you remain. They will all grow old like a garment, like a cloak. You will fold them up, and they will be changed. But you are the same, and your years will not fail. To which of the angels has he ever said, Aha! Uh -huh. Sit at my right hand till I make your enemies your footstools. Are they not all ministering spirits sent forth to minister for those who will inherit salvation? I know I read NLT. You may be wondering, okay, what am I intending to bring out of here? Um, NKJV. If you read your version, you will realize that Jeez, uh, the scriptures, Paul, well, many people have argued that it's not Paul that wrote the Hebrews, that there's no clear cut um, inscription to show that it was Paul that wrote it, but some people still agree that it was Paul that wrote it. I was trying to say something here that God always obeys men, He brings them and drops them lower. Why? So that it can also lift them up. Looking at the express image of Christ, there was a glory ahead. There was the full, he was already God in fullness. 
But what did he do? He showed us a typology of what needed to be done. You will be made a base. You will be brought low. You know what the scripture says? Matthew 12, 24. It says, except John, sorry, John 12, 24. Except a corn of wheat. Except it is planted to the soil. Except it is buried. It abided alone. But if it is buried, what will it do? It will bring forth much fruit. So what am I saying? When you go through crisis, especially this interpersonal crisis, it's for your maturity and the building of your faith, your character in God. What do I mean? How does God use this to build your character? I'm just digressing here a bit. You may face rejection. You may face disappointment. You may face deception. You may face disagreement. All those this, this, this. Yes. And it will always come from men. That's to show you that it is God. You may have bind, cast, lose, do everything. And yet it's not still working. Sometimes. Eh? Just look again. It may be God tearing down your nest and trying to build you. What was the response of that third servant in Matthew chapter 25 that was given talent? One servant was given five, another was given two, another was given one. Look at the response of the one that was given one. He says, I know you. That you are a hard see what who the man there, that master in that picture was God. God is a is, is a loving father, who, but it's also a consuming fire. When he wants to train soldiers, when God is trying to build your capacity, you will pass through fire. Check Daniel, check Meshach, Shedrach, and Abednego. They went through the fairy furnace. They went through the lion's den. Go and check through all those people who they call the fathers of faith in Hebrews 11. All of them, without exception, they went through this interpersonal conflict. They went through that struggle, internal struggles, family struggles, church fights. The Lord will help us in Jesus' name. All right, let's make the substantiative. This is where the famous adage for evil to happen, all that needs to be done is for good men to do nothing. This guy said, it also mean personality conflict such as I just do not like so and so's personality. I do not like people who are loud or so. Since Mr. Sims is loud, I will prevent him from being elected for the position of deacon. Thus, there is no logic or cause for the conflict. Just the fact that we do not like someone or something based on experiences and perceptions. Or I do not like praise music in church, so I would I do all that I can to prevent it from being introduced into our worship. Yeah, so man, that, that, this substantive is a very, very, uh, I'm sorry, I used to say this, that is more or less like witchcraft. When you are trying to bend everything to be in your way. That's witchcraft. Because witchcraft simply means to bend. You don't even want it to be God's way anymore. It should be you. Your personal, your way. Ah. I pray for you. God will not replace us in Jesus' name. So let's move on. Let's move on quickly. I want us to. Be careful about that uh, interpersonal relationship. Let's look at some strategic conflicts. This is a conflict of moral grounds. This is the area that theological disputes come from. Yes. This is what led to having different denominations. This is the conflict that led to different denominations. Where some people say we worship angels. We worship the images of Jesus we saw. We worship uh, uh, color and uh, hymns and uh, this. We support abortion. We do not support abortion. And we support uh, speaking in tongues. We do not support speaking in tongues. Well, 
if these substantive conflicts are not well managed, they usually used to uh, become very big, to become interpersonal conflict or intrapersonal conflict. I know people who fight on social media just for pastors, on behalf of their pastors. Maybe they liked one pastor beyond the other one. Before you know it, they, oh my God, they can, they can, there's no ground for that dispute. Oh. They may not greet the next person. I know families who became divided just because of election. Because one person supported one party, the other one did not support the party. And they just became, they could not see themselves. Did I even say family? What about churches? What about church? That's why we always want men of God uh, and upcoming leaders never to pub you can be a member of a party that there's no wrong in that as a leader but you do immediately you become a leader especially in the church setting let me say this categorically so that i help somebody here i don't know what's going to happen in the next future you are not you are not permitted to publicly declare your allegiance especially using the pulpit to declare it you will be incorrect. You'll be very wrong to do that. You'll be very wrong to do that. And let me encourage you, please avoid it by all means. Avoid it. Avoid it. Because it's a trap. Especially when it comes to the issue of politics. It's a big trap. It's a big trap to... um to render the voice of God in your mouth, it's a big trap to render it useless, to render it insufficient. So don't fall for that trap. Don't fall for that. Many, go and check. All those that prophesy towards the elections, prophesied and prophesied and prophesied and prophesied, and, and not even one doge of those prophecies came to fulfillment. Well, and look at, if you talk now, will you respect them? You tell them no. You, when you said it some years back, he had no water, so there's no point. Even if they're now, they are now moved by God concretely, and they're now prophesying correctly under God, nobody will still accept it. People will be struggling with it. It's like that, um, what do I, uh, my father used to say, there's a French proverb. It says, don't tell lie. So if you tell lie once, and you are caught, even if the next time you are telling the truth, Nobody will believe you because you have told a lie before. They will believe that that's your way. It becomes an attitude thing. So we have to be very careful here. Very careful here. I don't know. It's not coming to mind, but I remember um, the, the conflict between Apostle Paul and Barnabas. Remember, it was these same two people in Acts chapter nine, chapter eight, that were separated from a fasting and prayer. They were fasting and praying, and God spoke in the midst of the fasting and prayer for them to be separated for the missionary work. And they went on to the missionary work. But at some point, conflict came. Uh huh. And it caused that the church should split. The two of them should split and go their separate ways. I tell you the truth. If that split did not happen, I don't think the gospel will have come to Africa. Because history has shown that that was when Barnabas came to Africa, came to the likes of Ethiopia, Egypt, and preached the gospel of Jesus. So it was like more or less the first missionary that visited Africa. Because the way he sailed, looking from history, the way he's, the direction he sailed was the direction of Africa. Just by the way. So most of the time when there is a conflict, as a church member, especially when there's a conflict among church leaders, be careful to take sides. I'm saying this to help somebody. They used to say, if two elephants fight, who will suffer it is the grass. 
So my prayer for you is that don't allow the two elephants fight and you go and join one elephant to say, I, I supporting this elephant. You will suffer for it because you may not know that it may be God that is behind that conflict. Maybe God was about to do something new to this earth. What I would advise you to do is to go back to God and start praying that God should open your eyes to see the next instruction. Because imagine the first miracle that Jesus did in John chapter 2. The wine had finished at the wedding. Imagine if they started arguing and, 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 and there was a conflict. Even as Jesus and Mary were saying different things, they were communicating, they were having communication difficulty. But Mary understood Jesus by the response he gave. And Mary just, what did he do? She tried to manage the conflict at that point, conflict of interest at that point, and said to the men, say, look, whatever he says to you, obey. Just do it. Don't even ask questions. He gave them a matching order. She must have watched him. She must have, she must have known who Jesus is. She must have observed him so much that he's touched with the grief. The pain that people go through. Jesus always touched with it. So when he told Jesus about the pain that the people were about to go in to go through. You know, Jesus needed to process it. So what did he do? He just spoke to the man. Just listen to whatever he says. I pray the Lord will help us. Sometimes in resolving conflict, some conflicts or crisis, you need to give those people time to process it. Let them come to themselves. The Lord will help us. It's not. I'm not saying... Let me clarify that. I'm not saying you split ways. It's not all the time you split ways. But sometimes you could stay apart for a season. I remember, yes, in psychology, especially when it comes to um, before a divorce is, um, is the process is put into action, they try to tell them to come together for a season, for a period of time, and they try to monitor them if they notice that even in that season they were not able to resolve anything, then they will put them apart for a while. For a season. After that season, they will return them together. If they now cannot live on their own separately or they cannot live together, even when they said they should stay apart, they could not live together, that means when they come together, they'll try to resolve. But if they don't, if they feel okay with each other's um, individuality, well, but it's just that those processes have been abolished these days. And it has become like a two for pure five naira. People just get it at the speed of the guy. They know how to write the write the case. Lawyers are now twisting the arm of the law to make it happen like the speed of light. The Lord will deliver us in Jesus' name and bring us back to the real thing in Jesus' name. All right, so let's um, begin to round up here tonight. Whoa, okay. I hope, sorry. Sorry, my screen is hanging just a little minute. Okay. Okay, there are several examples there of um, crisis in the church or church splits, scandals, financial impropriety, sexual scandals, Schisms, divisions, succession crisis, marital crisis, ethnical, tribalistic, mm, political parties. I mentioned many of these things. Financial crisis. Hmm. This one, eh? Only God can save, can save the church. You can even mention some others that you can think of. That you can think of. Listen, all this, I can say it again and again. All these crises cannot be avoided. But you can resolve the body can be resolved. They can be resolved. Jesus speaking said we should of we should avoid offense. 
He said it was better the person was not born. Avoid being the offender. Avoid being the person who will steer somebody up for unforgiveness. Say it was better you were not being born. Or it was better that they tied a millstone to you and throw you to the deep of the sea. You see how bad that is? So, now for you to now cause crisis in the church. Now, at this point, I, I, I think I should answer this question. Somebody asked me, what if the crisis is between a church member and the pastor of the church? I will say very much to you. Listen, you cannot be in conflict with the pastor of your church. Then he is no more your pastor. Just pack your bag and your Bible and move to the next church that you believe that the that pastor over there is now your new pastor. Please, warning, don't do it in terms of emotion or don't do it in terms of uh, anagogri. Uh, I want to make him know that I am very useful. God can replace you with stones. They told, they asked Jesus, tell them to keep quiet. He said, look, if I ask them to keep quiet, stones will get up and begin to speak. So, don't because uh, I'm the one financing the church. I'm the one paying for all the projects. I'm the one doing this, doing that. And he's not recognizing me. He's not giving me bishop. I'm not becoming, he's not ordaining me as deacon. I'm not giving the role as a pastor. Uh, if you try that one, and that's the one you are having an issue with the pastor, listen, God, you will know that God rules in the affairs of men. He did it to Nebuchadnezzar. He made him go into the beasts, into the forest like a beast for seven good years until he came to himself to say that, Lord, the God of heavens rules in the affairs of men. So please, avoid that trap. Please, avoid that trap. It's a trap of the devil. It's a trap of the devil. All these traps mentioned here, please, See to it that you are not the offender. You are not the one being used to set up this crisis. You are not the one being used to start up this crisis. So if you need to develop your character, work on it. Work on it. That was why David was sent into the habits. He was anointed at the age of 17. But he did not become king until he was 30. So for 13 years, God was building his character. 13 good years. 13. The Lord will help us tonight in Jesus' name. I hope I have not stayed beyond time. Sources of conflict, several sources of conflict, control. Yes. Even in marriage, there are only two things that causes more conflict. is the conflict of control. It's the, the conflict is either conflict of control, power, who is in charge? Leadership. Who is giving direction? Or it's a conflict of who is taking the decision? Or is the conflict of doctrine, of acceptance? The style, financial matters. Okay, let's go into how to resolve this conflict. Very quickly, I want us to resolve. If conflict is unresolved, it can begin to fester and grow. It can become cancerous in the church body and then eventually can end with the church being in crisis mode. Offense and hurt that is not addressed can damage a church body and can cause division, even the church to split. If a conflict is resolved quickly and handled correctly, it will lead to repentance, growth, and a new understanding of grace and forgiveness. So that's why you need to resolve conflict very quickly. Conflict takes away the energy and focus of the church from the things that matter most. It's a tactic of the devil to trigger strife, to, to stagnate the church from fulfilling our mandates. Failing to resolve conflict has a last effect on the ministry. It has a very lasting effect on the ministry. I tell you the truth. Many churches, um, even Pentecostals, 
that you see that has stagnated, if you go and check properly, it's a crisis. It's one conflict or the other that are not set out. That was what have, would have stagnated the church in Acts chapter 6. There was a conflict. There was a crisis. People were beginning to grumble that, oh, some people are special, we do. The others were not special. That would have split the church and would have stalled the growth of the church. If the apostles didn't take the right decision there of absorbing themselves off sharing tables and giving the responsibility to people among them, and that's what led to them selecting leaders, deacons, and all that. If not, it would have been a problem. It would have been a very big problem. Apologies, please bear with me. I want to finish this tonight. I don't want us to stay over this. I want to end it once and for all tonight. I will be done in a few minutes. I'm going into how we can resolve conflict, conflict and crisis. Um, Barnabas, I've given that example already. Impact of crisis. Many people get hurt. I've seen people who have said they will never come to church again. And as I'm talking to you till today, they've never gone into a church, church service. They will tell you worship online till today, not even before COVID came. After COVID, they still remain in, in their houses. And these people are so deep in the things of God. But when I listen to them, I know that it was somebody in the leadership that hurt them. Conflict quenches the spirit of God. It quenches the flow of the spirit of the Holy Spirit does not dwell in in a conflict zone or crisis zone or in disunity. It is where there is unity. So that's where he commands the blessing. That's where the, the oil flows from the head to the skirts. Church crisis make, make some members leave their churches. Yes. Many people leaving from one church to another. And sometimes we will even say it is God that tells me to leave. May God help us. It's conflict. It's one resolve or the other. I want to quickly get to the last page of this. Sorry, I can't go. Yes. Um, the biblical injunction is found in Matthew chapter 18, verse 15 to 17. How do you resolve a conflict? Now, you know the conflict already there. It's unavoidable. They're already there. How do we now resolve in it? How do we get it done? Number one, first, if you know you have wronged someone, or someone has wronged you, you don't go about gossiping, telling people, oh, yeah, see what he did to me, see what he did. That's gossip. That's gossip. Matthew 18, 15 to 17 says, if your brother or sister sins, go and point out their fault just between the two of you first. Not going to tell the third party. It's you and the person first. Many of us are breaking the scriptures in this. If third party does not come, we don't listen. If they listen to you, you have, you, can you see what the word, the Bible used there? It's listen. I said it again. The problem is communication, listening to you. You have won them over. But if they will not listen, it's a decision. The decision to listen is a personal decision. The decision not to listen is also a personal decision. Ah, I won't agree until we get to heaven. Excuse me, do you think you will be settling conflict in heaven? You better resolve your conflict here on earth. You can't bring that. Don't let that stop you from entering heaven. No? Because conflict can stop you from entering heaven. Crisis can stop you from entering heaven. Because of unforgiveness that are beyond that crisis. Being offended. Offense can take you out of the path. Take one or two others along. That's the next one. If they don't listen, take witnesses, two or three witnesses with you. So that every matter may be established by the testimony of two or three witnesses. If they still refuse to listen, can you see? Tell it to the you see the you see the layers. Tell it to the church. When they say the church here, yeah, they are referring to the church leadership. Tell it to the church leadership, to the elders of the church, those who are concerned about the both of you. And if they refuse to listen even to the church, treat them as you would a pagan or a tax collector. That's where you can now charge them to court. They refuse to listen to the church, the church leader. It's like they refuse to listen to Jesus. 
But this is one thing I will say at this at this junction. Especially for those who are offended or they've been, they, you are carrying a hot and you're looking for a way to drop it. Listen, that person you're offended against, eh? It's a very simple exercise. Get either an item or a picture or something that denotes that person and begin to pray over that thing. Just pray all manners of prayer. I did not say swear for the person, swear or begin to curse. I say pray on that. Begin to pray all manners of prayer on it. If you are praying genuinely on that person, I tell you, you won't be able to harbor hatred against that person. But the reason why we carry where hatred is able to find its foothold is because we are not praying genuinely for that person. Because the person you say you love and you don't pray for, you can't say you love somebody and you'll be, you say you, um, you, you are praying for somebody and you will hate that person. No, 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 no. It's not possible. It's not possible. Those two, can, they don't mix. They don't mix. So please, it says, don't escalate right away. Mind your language. You see communication there again. A hot-tempered person stirs up conflict, but the one who is patient, calm, a quarrel. Those who guide their mouth and their tongue keep themselves from calamity. I say this especially for those of us that are women. When the Bible was talking about women, in Proverbs 31 there, it says he builds a house. If you go back and read, it was talking about you use your mouth to build. It was not your hand. Go and check. Check that. Just read from that 31 from the beginning. You will realize that it was the mouth she was using to build that house. It was not her hand. Her hand will get it, but the mouth was the first place. Many women, I, usually, I say this again, that uh, they've been gotten battered or abused physically. I'm not trying to make a brief for men that have done this. It's not a good thing. But many a times, it was because they didn't reframe their tongues in the day of calamity. They said things. Even those who get, especially when you are angry, there are two times that you, you are not expected to see anything. When you are angry, when you are too happy, because those are emotional states. You don't make promises when you are too happy. You don't say words when you are angry. Because what you said, you will not, you not mean it, but the devil, devil and demons will capitalize on it. So stop putting yourself in that trap where you now need many years of fasting and prayer to break just because you were angry. They call it just a few minutes of madness and you said things and you are now breaking it for years. The Lord will give us understanding of these things in Jesus' name. Colossians 4, 6 says, let your conversation be always Always, that's the word. Not just sometimes. Always full of grace, seasoned with salt. If people listen to you, do they feel relief? If people come to you or they are afraid of coming to you, irrespective of their age or their size or their gender, they should find solace in conversing with you if you are a true believer. So that you may know how to answer every word. You must have a subtle answer. Yorubas have this saying. They say, Pelela Kaolabo. Sorry for those who are not Yoruba. They are saying, sorry, has different versions. You have the real sorry. And you have the sorry to spite the other person. We need to be very careful in our conversation. I say it again. It's communication that fuels many conflicts. It fuels it. It even makes it become like a bomb and makes the whole split situation become... Because if you listen... listen especially, I, I, I say this maybe because I'm a pastor, I'm saying this. If you sit down and are listening to couples going through one issue or the other, if you listen very well, you will see that he said, uh, she said this or he said this and I did this. 
or I said this and he did that. It's always about what was said. So why don't you mind what you say? I always used to say this to those that are close to me. I said the same fountain cannot bring forth hot and bring forth cold. So you can also use the same mouth, curse, and use the same mouth to bless. Be careful. Be careful. Reframe your tongue. No wonder the book of James was saying that if you say you, have, you are a believer and you are a true Christian and you are worshipping God, your, your real Christian virtue is in control. Putting your tongue in control. Say like horses, using the description of the horses, that they put bits in their mouths. And from the control of their tongue, putting the chains on their tongues, they are able to control the horse to anywhere they want. If you control your tongue, your head will go in the direction of the control of your tongue. Eh, uh, I, I didn't mean it, I didn't mean it. I didn't mean it, you, but you thought about it before you said it. So that's why was, the Bible used to say, feed your heart, guard your heart with all diligence, for out of it are the issues of life. If you begin to think on good things, what will come out of your heart will be, your mouth will always be gracious words. But if you begin to think of evil, you will also speak evil. The Lord will help us. Number C, be quick to resolve. I've mentioned this. Starting a quarrel is like breaching a dam. So drop the matter before a dispute breaks out. In your anger, do not sin. Do not let the sun go down while you are still angry. Matthew 5, 26, 25 and 26. Settle matters quickly with your adversary who is taking you to court. Do it while you are still together on the way. Or your adversary may hand you over to the judge and the judge may hand you over to the officer and you may be thrown into prison. Truly, I tell you, you will not get out until you have paid with your last penny. Many people have lost divine connections in their life. They've lost destiny. They've lost things that should have built their character. Maybe the reason why you lost that, uh, why they lost uh, that general manager job, that CEO opportunity of being coming the head, was well, because they didn't learn character when there was a small conflict, small small office conflict, they will explode. Nobody can control them. They want to use their fists. They want to use the words of their mouth. They want to throw banter. Let's desist from this. Let's be quick to resolve conflict. Hey, Pastor, are you saying I should become weak? Yes, Jesus was made weak that you may become strong. So if you become weak for the person to be strong and you have won a brother, is it not better than losing a brother to the devil and the devil begins to make hold of the person? Okay. At this point, I, have help, I hope I've helped. I will quickly open the floor for questions. So if you have questions, I think that's the last slide there. If you have questions, please, I would like to answer your question. Yes, questions, please. I'll be glad to answer questions. Quickly, 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 quickly. Time is of great essence tonight. Okay. I hope. I have a question. All right, go ahead, brother Daniel. Go ahead, sir. Because uh, I can see that this is a practical class, and uh, sure. we also show experience we, we might have in our Christian journey. Very good. Cool. Very sure, sir. The question I want to ask is that, you know, sometimes when, when you first came to Christ, yeah. I, I, it affects me, and I, I know that it will affect other people. You know, you start with grace. You understand yeah. the gospel, you give your life to Jesus, everything, boom, boom, boom. After some time, maybe because your mom get closer, to, uh, get, get closer to God, you know, such a thing, a lot of things now, your life, you know, when you're exposed to God, God will be showing you a lot of things that you sometimes begin to look at yourself, ah, do I really believe in the first, first instance? Do, do you understand what I mean? Then you, be, you, you begin to want to do things now out of grace. You know, that's the way you start with grace. I want to use a uh, law. Not, you're not trying to move toward the area of law that I want to do this, I want to, to please God. I don't know mm -hmm. what I know, that's what I mean. I'm trying to, I'm trying to go on, go on. That go on you, with you the start with grace. 
I you get start, it. Sorry, I get that you great. start with grace. I get that part yeah. that you say you start with grace okay. and you begin to deviate gradually into the law. Continue. Yeah, not that you, and not that you deviate. Maybe as you come closer to God, you know, yeah. there's a prophet in, in the Bible that when he moved closer to God, God now showed to him that hey, his, his grace is not you. He, he exposes all his weakness. Maybe sure. in the past. Sure. Yeah. So the Bible now begins to think, ah, I will now please God. Forgotten grace that you begin to want to begin to uh, follow the trend, trend of law. You know, I, I know it has happened to me before. Okay. And that yeah. really affect me. Okay. Uh, okay. So and the question really now. Affected, uh, that that didn't really affected me much. Uh, it's like I, I, I started with grace now. I begin to now follow law, uh, trying to do this, trying to do this, trying to, and trying to do this one. And that's one, that's one question. Another one is that there are some things you pass through as a Christian, I pass through my personal life. You know, we, we, we normally say that in the Bible, and, and, and you, every your problem, you can always see it in the scripture. You can, you can find the solution in the scripture. Now you discover that there's certain things that occur to you. you. It's not straightforward in the scripture, and you are trying to look through, through. You cannot relate to it. How do you handle such a thing? Mm, that's a very good one. Let me start from the yeah. back one, the second one that you asked. Yeah. yeah. The third one, so I can finish it, so I can okay, ask the third one. Ask the third, yes, ask the third, sir. Go on. The last one is my, my, my work in the office. If you, if you remember today, uh, Pastor talked about in the consecration, in the, that's the, the morning division something. In, in my office, this thing I, I've been battling with. You know, it, a lot of things we do in the, in the office. As a Christian, if you look at it critically, it's not properly done. Even the organization approve of it. For example, let me give you an example now. Like now, you know, in my organization, we are, we are into training. We are going to do a lot of certification so that I can be able to deliver a lecture. But, but in, during the process of doing that uh, certification filling form, you discover the, 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 the body that asks you to do the exam, they want you to be straightforward, not, not to lie. But because of your organization want to make use of you, they want you to lie. And uh, you have this experience, you have this experience, and they want to help you to sign it. And the organization say that if you have not gotten the experience, you cannot do the exam. Hmm. So this thing in, 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 in my, my office, it affects me because they want me to go and do the, the certification and lie. They will help me to sign so that they, to the advantage, I can be satisfied. But at the end of the day, when I look at it, there's a conflict in my mind. And that thing set me back a lot. So how do you handle such thing? Okay. Um, let me try and do justice. I'm trusting God to be able to answer this. Number one, the first one, when you are beginning to having conflicts with, um, anytime you have conflict and it's conflicting with the standard of God, anytime, no matter who that person is, even if it's a pastor, and he's saying, God said, and you have not found in the scripture, and you cannot see that thing expressly to you. The Bible says, no scripture is of private interpretation. Now, when it is like that, please pull out. There's no harm. God will always meet you at your level. I always say that. Pull out. And you see God come through. Don't join them. Don't try to cut corners. The same people that you cut corners with today, eh? when something that is legitimate, that should now rightfully come to you, they will be the same ones that will raise their eyebrows and say, ah, he got the other one by deceit. Are you sure he's not getting this one too by another form of deceit? Even when you are legit for it, like I said, the French are this. You told a lie yesterday. Today, even if you are telling the truth and you are, you are shedding blood on the truth, you will be considered to be a liar. So please, don't accept to that ploy. Sometimes, that ploy could be God testing you to strengthen your character. Many people will fall. Look at Joseph. In the house of Potiphar. If she if Joseph slept with Potiphar, Potiphar's wife, nobody will know. Rather, he will be promoted to become so and he will be honored, but he will still remain a slave. Did you go? I just said he will still yes. remain a slave. 
But what happened? Through that crisis, he landed in the prison, not knowing that it was God orchestrating him to find himself in the prison. Because God had a better plan for him in the prison. God had the person who will make him activate his destiny in the prison. That person was coming to meet him in the prison. So, sometimes, what did I say sometimes? Many times, when those times of scenario play out, like you are saying in the office now, it is God testing your faith. When, say, the same Sarah, Hey, oh, I don't know why this example came to me now. The same Sarah that suggested to Abraham that, uh, look at my servant, Agai, is here. Uh, okay, fulfill the promise of God through her now. And Ishmael was born, right? It was the same Sarah. When Abraham went to complain to God about the trouble in his home, in his family, God told Abraham to go and listen to that Sarah. Did you get what I just said? The same person that put you in the trouble. Eh? Is the same person God is speaking to, to you. Can you beat that? <laughs> so some, uh, this God, eh? I call him the uncaused cause. Nothing can cause him, but it can cause all things. He's the one. He, he, there is nothing. Nothing can come to that. Nothing can happen to God by surprise. Hey, ah, uh, something happens. Ah, God will not say, ah, ah you these people, Sha. Ah, ah, this one is a, another wow. Is it, God will say that? No, 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 nothing. Nothing can come to God by surprise. Nothing can come to God by surprise. Then uh, question number two. When you're reading the scripture and you're not finding express words to your aches of your heart, let me say this. Sir, mm. do this with small routine. Pray in the spirit first. Pray first. Eh? Then immediately you finish praying, grab the Bible. I tell you, you will find answer. But please, don't be mechanical about it. Because you know, one problem we find ourselves, especially those of us that have stayed long in the um, in Bible study and all that, when we even were reading Bible stories, that there has been, studies have been done over them over and over again, is those things that people said those times will be blocking us while we are reading the new one. But the Bible says, the word of God is new. Every morning. You can stand on that word and you say, Lord, just unveil the newness of this word to me. No scripture is of private interpretation, but in every situation, there is a word for it. There is a scenario that plays out for it. Can you just show me? And you'll be surprised. Even as I'm speaking to you right now, you see, I've used examples from the scripture that ordinarily some people say ah, it, it doesn't correlate, but that's how it comes came. And I've explained, and that's how I moved on. I've moved on. Yeah. Amen. So, um, the first one talking about grace, and you now move into the law. Yeah, listen. Sometimes the reason why such things happen, I'll be very frank with you. It was God trying to build you up. You know, when you were a baby, you you drank milk. The milk was provided for you. Everybody washed your plate. Everybody cleaned you up. Everybody was trying to keep the care of you. But after some time, God by himself, just like what he does, like Mother Eagle does to the eaglets, he was always going to capture the food and bring to the eaglets. He was always going to capture the food and bring to the eaglets in the nest. But after some time, what would he, the Mother Eagle will do? The next time he's coming, he will bring a spike. He will bring uh, what they call tongues and begin to put into the nest. You think he's trying to strengthen the nest more? No. He's trying to put a spike so that the baby eaglets will be jumping. Will be jumping up. Will not be feeling comfortable there again. Wanting to jump out of the place. When they see the baby eaglet jumping up and flapping his way, jumping up, flapping his way, jumping up, he will now pick the baby eaglets with his mouth, with his beak on his back. 
and pick him and swear high and drop it. Now he's now deliberately doing it and leave it for you to, to start out for fear. If he knows that he's going, almost going to crash land, he will bring his feather and just come and catch it and take it up again. He will repeat the process again and again and again until the eaglet wake comes to the sensitivity that knows that all she needs, he or she needs to do is to just spread his wings and begin to fly. And many months after, it begins to fly and it flies away from the watch you. It will now fly away from the eagle. It has to go and look for new territories to conquer. It cannot come close to that eagle after a while. After six months, three months, it does cannot come close. It has to go and look for new, especially if it's a male eagle, it has to go and look for new territories to conquer. Else it may be put to, it may be killed. May be killed, you know, because it will become a very skin contest in that area. So, you, this is what I would just say. You have to be very careful against attachments, because most times, why we think we are deviating into law is because we were attached. Look at it, the scenario that played out in Egypt: seven years of abundance. That was Greece now. Abi? Mm -hmm. Yeah. There are seven years of what? Of hunger, of famine. They, if they were not sensible enough to apply the law to sustain that grace they have enjoyed, the whole world will have been wiped out in that famine. Did I help you in that explanation? Yeah, thank you. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you very much, sir. Any other question, bro? Samson, question, Stabusola, and um, any other person, Stoin Damola, let's go. Questions, clarifications on tonight's teaching. The um, my brother, are they still on this call? Um, Do you do my days? Are they on this call? I don't think so. I don't think so. Questions tonight? If we don't have questions, are we saying that we understand everything and we are happy to say that we have done well tonight uh, being here tonight? All right. At this junction, without wasting much of our time, we have spent almost, wow, I have spent almost one hour plus. Okay, thank you for being here. It was nice having you. I trust that you've been blessed. The recordings, okay. Uh, Sister Winda Mola, raise your hand. Go ahead and ask a question, please. Go ahead and ask a question. I can't hear you. I don't know if anyone can hear you. Yes, you're muted, but we can't hear you. Can you just increase your volume a little bit? So, okay. Okay. Is that you or brother Neil that is speaking? I, honestly, I can't hear. I can't hear it too. Okay. All right. Sister Buzala, you can Sister Inamala, you can write your question if you are having difficulty in the network. You can write your question quickly. Let me just wait. I'll just pause to expect your question in the chat room. I'll just wait to write your question in the chat room. Question tonight. Bro Samson, do you have a question? Bro Busola, you have, do you have a question? Uh, let me just say this also to add to, especially for those of us that are intending couples. Um, if you are in courtship and you have not quarreled, you are just deceiving yourselves. Okay, you don't have a question. All right. Okay. You are just deceiving yourselves. You're through. You need, like my teacher will say, you need to see somebody 
in the four dimensions of the seasons of the earth. There are four seasons. You need to see them in the complete four seasons. That is the times of their high, the times of their low, the times in their worst identity, and when they were mild, when they were sick, when they, when there was one issue or the other. So that you don't you, you don't see them in their true color one day and you'll be saying, Jesus, Jesus, Jesus. No, you were the one that did not see them. Jesus knew them already. Okay, sir, it's not really a question, but I want to ask if it is possible for us to get the lesson outlined so we can go through it. Okay, all right. Um, okay, maybe I can send you the slide. I can send this slide after now. By the grace of God. But there are most many things I said that are not in the slide. What I can only advise is that you can find that on the audio, the audio recording of this. You can listen to this audio recording. I'll post it on my YouTube page and you can download for yourself later. All right, it was nice having us tonight. So please, if you have not quarreled, go and quarrel so that you can you can know the other person. So that you know you know that the other person can quarrel and break TV, scatter the whole place. Something that you have put together for 20 years, you can scatter the whole thing in one day. That's what some people do with conflicts. So you know how to handle it. So you know whether you want to continue or you want to put an end to it. Even if God, like my pastor will say, even if God has said, <laughs> it is where there are things you need to know. You need to know. You need to know them inside out. It will help you a lot. It will help you a lot. It will help you a lot. And be quick to know yourself. Not even knowing the other person. It is yourself first. Know yourself. What will I do? If I am angry, if I am not happy, what will I say? What am I supposed to say? What am I not supposed to say? That's some of the things I've shared tonight. How do I go about resolving a conflict? And I trust God that the Holy Spirit will breathe on his word, will amplify these words in our hearts, and it will be productive to the glory of his dear name in Jesus' precious name. We have prayed. Amen. So, dear Lord, Heavenly Father, tonight we thank you for your word that has come forth. We know you have spoke expressly to every situation, every heart. Lord, let this word become seeds that we grow to become the, the big mustard seed where other birds of the earth can now build their nest on it in the name of Jesus. And let us be productive. Amen. You remove every accomplice, unforgiven spirit, they are dissolved Amen. tonight. Every hatred of any sort from their hearts are dissolved tonight in the name of Jesus. We receive the boldness Amen. to resolve every conflict Amen. in the name of Jesus. And the conflict that you are steering up Amen. to set us on new paths of destiny, I decree that eyes are open Amen. to see those new paths in the name of Jesus. Amen. Amen. All forgiveness will not blindfold Amen. us on any sort. Rather, our eyes will be open to see the new Amen. things God is about to do in the name of Jesus. Thank you, Heavenly Father. Amen. We give you Thank all you. the praise. For in Jesus' you, precious name, we are prayed. Amen. 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 All right. Amen. Thank you very much for being here. I'm going to stop the recording right away.